Our shining star today is Salama ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Very young Sahabi. Very young Sahabi. There is a expedition that he led, which we will talk about shortly, in which he performed amazing feat. At that time, when he was leading this expedition, he was only 12 years old. He was an extremely fast runner, and he was known amongst the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majma'in for his bravery, shuja'a, for being fast and running, and that nobody, no one could outrun him, to the extent that it became known that he was faster than the fastest horse that was known about him. Salama ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala. And extremely brave at such a young age. It was just something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to him as a gift. Otherwise we know when a person is growing up, a child, a little bit of darkness comes into his room and he gets scared. Let alone him being able to fight against enemies that are much bigger than him. Saying this, I will say that though he was 12 years old, my assumption is, and I'm not sure, that though he was 12, he was tall for his age, likelihood is, and he was quite big too. Uh, because if you read and you hear what I'm going to tell you about what he accomplished, what he did on one of these expeditions, you'll be very, very amazed. And you'll be forced to think that he, how could he have been 12 years old to do this? But sometimes we see some children are young, but they're mature than their age and bigger than their age too. And sometimes it's the opposite way around as well. We've talked about a couple of tribes that have, tribes that have similar names. We read, we talked about Banu Salim, we talked about Banu Salama, we talked about Banu Sulaim. Sulaim was the tribe of Sa'ad. Al-Aswad, we talked about him. He was one of our shining stars. That was a tribe that was located in the region um, near the well of Mauna where there was a, 70 Sahaba were massacred and they also were part of that massacre. That was Banu Sulaim. Then there's Banu Salim and Banu Salama. These two tribes were located in Medina Munawwara. And then there's one other tribe, similar name, Banu Aslam. This was the tribe of Salama ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala and this tribe was outside of Medina Munawwara and after accepted Islam they migrated to Medina and the rule was in the time of Rasulullah that the place that you migrate to you can't leave there and you can't go back to the original place where you migrated from we talked about this when we were talking about Wail ibn Hujr our first Sahabi in the shining stars because it's just like a person giving a gift to someone and then taking it back. This is a good deed that you performed, you gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're taking back. So when you perform the migration for the sake of Allah, leaving behind your whole life, your old life, and then you go back to it. So that defeats the whole purpose. But this tribe was very special in that sense, inshallah, we'll talk about that. Some of the special things about Salam ibn Aqwa we'll talk about first, inshallah, then we'll talk about this expedition that he led. Number one, he was a radif of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There's many books written on the subject of who was a radif of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst the sahaba. A radif means those sahaba who had the honor of sitting behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his mount. Any Sahabi who had the honor of sitting behind Rasulullah sallallahu on his mount had a very high status amongst the Sahaba as well. He was called a Radif. That he's sitting with whom? The last of all prophets. On a mount with him. So his body is next to the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. Salam ibn Aqwa radiallahu anhu had this honor not once but many times. 
This is because of the special status that he enjoyed with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he says about himself, "Ardafani Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam miraran." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam made me his radif many times on multiple occasions. And he also says that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on multiple times he put his hands through my hair as a sign of affection, which means that he was not so tall; he was still a child. You wouldn't, do some that, you wouldn't do something like that with an adult. You'd do that with a child. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam put his hands through my hair many, many times, and he's made istighfar for me. He's made istighfar for me and for my children. Adada ma biyadiya min al asabiyah as many fingers I have on my hands. So that's at least ten times. One istighfar from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is enough for Jannah. He got it at least ten times for himself and his children. That's something Sahaba would die for. He got it ten times. Very high status. Once in the battle of Khaybar, which was the battle between, in which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam laid siege to the fortresses of the Yahud, including the tribe of Banu Nadir, which was originally in Medina Munawwara, then was exiled, and they came to Khaybar. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam laid siege to these fortresses that were owned by the Yahud. And finally, took over, and the Muslims acquired a lot of wealth in this. So, in this battle, he he also participated in this battle, and he got hit on his leg. Now, remember, it was known about the amongst the Sahaba that he was the fastest runner. So, when he was hit and slashed with a sword on his leg, that means he would never be able to walk again, let alone run. So. When he got hurt and he was injured on his leg, the word reached Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Salama has been hit on his leg. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam called Salama ibn Akwa radiallahu taala, and he said, "Salama, come here. I've heard that you've been hit on your leg." He said, "Yes, ya Rasulullah." So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam blew on it three times. Fama ashtakaytu hatta sa. To this day, I've never complained. He's gone. Injury was gone by the miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, as I mentioned, his tribe had migrated to Medina Munawwara. The rule was: once you've migrated, you've made the pledge with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now you can't leave the city of Medina Munawwara. There's an example of this just to illustrate this point, this rule. There was one Arabi, a Bedouin. Came to Medina Munawwara, made a pledge with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, bayah. Then he became sick. Many people used to come to Medina Munawwara. The climate was not right for them. They would become sick. He became sick, and it reached a point that he decided he's not going to live in Medina Munawwara anymore. And he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "I want to break my pledge. Please break my pledge, my bayah." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no. He left. Couple of days later, he came back again. Please break my bia. I don't want to keep the bia with you. How unfortunate a person! Rasulullah sallallahu said, "I can't break the bia." Couple of days later, he came back again. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, "I can't break the bia." Then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi found out that this man has taken off. He left Medina Munawwara. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Narrated a very beautiful point, beautiful hadith. He said that in this blessed city, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has made it haram for pious people, for good people, for, uh, for, for evil people to stay in here. This is why the city is called Taaba, the city of purity. It wipes out and cleans out all the bad people from it, just like when you take a uh, metal. A gold that has mixed with the other pieces of other metals, and you put it inside the furnace, and when you melt it down, the gold is separated from the other metals, and then you have pure gold. Same way, Medina Tayyibah, it's Taaba. It wipes out everything impure from it. That's why it became known as the city of Taaba, the city of purity, city of goodness. So Salam ibn Akwa radiallahu taala and his tribe they came to Medina Munawwara and then they went back out. 
So after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, somebody made an objection against the Sahabi Jabir ibn Abdullah. He came to him and he said to Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, "How many Sahaba are left in Medina Munawwara and the vicinities?" He said, "There's two besides me. There's Salam ibn Akwa and one other Sahabi." Anas ibn Malik and Jabir, uh, Salam ibn Akwa. So he said, Oh, Ab Salama, the one irtadda anil hijrati, who has become a murtad, another word for he has renounced his hijrah. He's using the word renounce as if renouncing is Islam. Because he was break, breaking the rule. He says, No, no, no. He says, I've heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to the tribe of Banu Aslam, Ubdu ya Aslam, go. Leave Medina Munawwara. So the, uh, the tribe of Aslam said to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, we migrated to Medina Munawwara and you're telling us to leave. We're afraid that we're renouncing our migration. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a special rule for the tribe of Banu Aslam. Nobody else was given this exclusive special right except the tribe of Banu Aslam. He said, Antum muhajiruna haythu kuntum. Doesn't matter where you go, you are migrators of you are migrators for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have migrated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot you can leave the city of Medina Munawwara, the place you migrated to stay anywhere you want, you'll be considered muhajireen. You'll be considered migrators. So see that these are some of the known things about Salam ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Some of his virtues. There's a couple of things that were also known about him. Very uh, unique things that the Sahaba knew and others knew. One of those things was that Salam ibn Akbar radiallahu anh, if anybody came to him and asked him for anything in the name of Allah, anything in the name of Allah, and he had it, he would give it away. That was just his habit. Automatic. So, just like it was known about, which Sahabi was it that we were talking about? couple of days back, I think a week back or so, that I think it was Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that whenever he finished his salah, the person who was sitting on his right and the person who was sitting on his left, he would hit the person on the right and hit the person on the left. That means you have to come with me for dinner today. That was known. So a person came to Amir al-Mu'mini Umar ibn Khattab, he says, I've been here for so many days, I haven't eaten. He said, make sure you pray salah next to Tamim al-Dari. So Salam ibn Akwa, anybody needed anything, people say go to him and ask him in the name of Allah. But he would say, he would always give it, but he would always say that when you ask for, some, for something in the name of Allah, that's ilhafa, obtrusive asking, meaning that's just like begging so much that you're, that you're forced to give it. The person who's being asked is forced to give it, he has no choice and that's haram. If you're asking out of necessity, it's okay. But if you're asking continuously, 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 until a person is on the verge that he has no choice and he gives it to you, this is called obtrusive begging. It's haram in Islam. It's called ilhafa. La yas'alun nasa ilhafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the fuqara, that they are not people who ask obtrusively. So he used to say, that when somebody asks me for something in the name of Allah, that's asking obtrusively. I can't say no. Because it's in the name of Allah. All he has to say is, please give me this in the name of Allah, and I have to give it. I can't say no, it's in the name of Allah. But he disliked people asking in that way, in the name of Allah, that for something so small, you're taking such a big name, for something of this dunya, you're taking the name of Allah. This dunya is not worth that we, for the sake of this dunya, of getting something from this dunya that you were using the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah has mentioned in a hadith about three people who Allah will not look upon on the day of judgment. One of those people is a person who was a businessman and he sold his items, the things that he sold. He sold them. And he used to swear by the name of Allah. This is very good. Nothing like this. Buy this. You'll never regret it. Wallahi. 
A person who sells his items, things that he's selling in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, swearing by the name of Allah just to get sell his items. That person Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look upon him because this person did not have any respect for the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just for this garbage of this dunya, he was saying the name of Allah and swearing by the name of Allah. He had no respect for the sacredness of the name of Allah. This is why when we see the name of Allah on the ground, pick it up and put it up. I say even if you see, forget the name of Allah, you see an alif on the ground, a, a, a paper with the letter alif on it or the letter lam on it, pick it up and put it up. It's known about, uh, what scholar was it? I'm trying to remember. He's a very famous Nahwi. Very famous Nahwi. Um, he's considered one of the top Nahwiyin, top Arabic uh, in Arabic syntax, which is a type of Arabic grammar. He was the Imam of that science, but he was a Mu'tazili. He was from a different sect. But it said about him that somebody saw him after his he died in their dream, and asked him that how did you fare with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? He said that once I was walking somewhere and I saw the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the ground and I picked it up and I put it in my pocket out of respect for the sanctity and the, the sanctity of the name of Allah and because of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave me just for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave me that I showed respect for his name Sibwe Imam Sibwe his book of Arabic syntax is called Al-Kitab. That's the name of his book, Al-Kitab. The book. So this is why he didn't like this. Another thing that was known about Salam ibn Aqwa, that whenever he performed wudu, anytime he performed wudu, he would always take a little bit of musk, he would lather onto his hands after he was finished, and then he would put it over his beard. Why? Because there's one Sahabi we're going to talk about, Abu Qatada, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Him and Salma ibn Aqwa were two of the leading people in the expedition of Zatul Qara that we're going to talk about, inshallah. Abu Qatada and once was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Salma ibn Aqwa was there and he was holding his beard and, Abu, and Abu, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Abu Qatada, he said, Akrimhu. Have respect for your hair. Most likely because his hair was disheveled or unkempt and he wasn't taking care of it or whatever the reason was. Likelihood that was the reason. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, have, have some respect for your hair. Salama ibn Aqwa was there. After that, he always made sure every time he performed wudu, lather a little bit of musk and put it on his beard properly. That was just his way of following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was his habit. Every single wudu he performed shows the amount of devotion and adherence to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the sahaba had in them. So devoted. Once they heard something from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, akrimhu, must respect it. There's a valley in Medina Munawwara called the Valley of Aqiq. A very blessed valley. Just like Mount Uhud. The range of Uhud. The set of mountains behind on the north side of Medina Munawwara. Very blessed. Rasulullah said about Uhud. That it is a mountain that, that loves me and I love it. Same way regarding the valley of Aqiq. Rasulullah said, Inni uhibbul Aqiq. I love the valley of Aqiq. Salam ibn Aqwa anhu was a hunter. Once he came back to Medina Munawwara from his hunting and Rasulullah saw him and he asked him, he said, Salama, where were you hunting today? And he said, in that direction. He said, in that direction? Salama, you went that way? He said, yes. He said, Salama, next time you hunt, go hunt in the valley of Aqiq. Next time you hunt, 
go hunt in the valley of Aqiq because inni uhibbul Aqiq. I love the valley of Aqiq. There's a lot of virtues mentioned about the valley of Aqiq. Because of those virtues that are mentioned in the ahadith, many of the sahaba after Rasulullah passed away, they moved away from Medina Munawwara and built their houses in the valley of Aqiq. Abu Huraira radiallahu is one of them. Salam ibn Akwa is one of them. It's, it's, now it's in Medina Munawwara, but in those times it was far. And it comes on the road called the road of Umar ibn Khattab. If you go straight on the road of Umar Khattab, the valley of Aqiq is right there. When you're leaving Medina Munawwara towards Makkah Makarma, it comes on the way. Sa'id ibn Zayd, he's one of our shining stars, his house was also on there. Urwa ibn Zubair, the son of Zubair Adilan, the nephew of Aisha Siddiqa, his house is right on the valley. To this day, you can still see remnants of his house and the, and the well that he made called the, the well of Urwa, Bi'ri Urwa. And there's also virtues for praying two raqas here. So, Rasulullah told Salam ibn Akwa that if you were to go and hunt in the valley of Aqiq, he said, if you were to go there before you went there to hunt, I would see you off. And when you come from the valley, talaqaytuka, I would come and meet you. That's how much love he had for the valley of Aqiq. So make sure you go to Medina Munawwara, you go to the valley of Aqiq. Visit it. Last thing, the expedition. It wasn't really an expedition. It was an incident that happened. And it's known as the expedition of Zatul Qara'a. At the time of this incident, Salama ibn Akwa is 12 years old. Early in the morning, Ghalas, the time when it's very dark at Fajr, the beginning time of Fajr when it's extremely dark, is the time when we pray our salawat, our salat of Fajr nowadays in Ramadan. He and Rabah was an Abyssinian slave. They went out both taking the horses owned by Talha bin Ubaidullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu towards a place called Ghaba. It's in the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, still is in the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. Ghaba means the place where there's a lot of trees. And even now there's a lot of trees there. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was some pulpit that was made, was made from, it was made out of wood. It was made from the trees from the area of Ghaba. There's a dam there now for holding water. I don't remember the name. It's not known by the name of Ghaba. But I've been there. Um, and it's a very blessed place because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would sometimes go there and the camels that were given as sadaqah, they used to graze in that area, the place of Ghaba. 20, 30 of them. And so... Salam ibn Akwa and Rabah were taking their horses so they could graze in the area because there's a lot of grass. There's a lot for the camels to graze on. They're on their way and the tribe of Banu Ghatfan, the tribe of Banu Ghatfan, not too far up north, a group of them, about 20, 30 of them, came on horses to take steel away those 30, 40 camels that were being herded by the brother of Abu Dhar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You know, the very Greek Sahabi Abu Dhar Ghifari, his younger brother, he was herding those sheep, taking care of those, sorry, taking care of those camels. From far away, Salam ibn Akwa sees these horses running, galloping, and he knows what's going on. He tells Rabah, take these horses, take all these horses, go back and inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that there's people attacking and they're going to take away the camels. I'm going to go right now and I'm going to fight with them. And I'm going to try to take the camels back away from them. They were very close to Ghaba, far away from Medina Munawwar. So Rabah turned back with the horses and Salama ibn Akwa took out his bone arrow. He had his javelin and he had his sword and he started running. He said, I entered into the area where there was a lot of trees. And I would hide behind the trees and start shooting arrows. And he said he was going so fast between the trees and shooting so quick. 
And at, from so many different locations, because he was going so fast, that they thought that there's a whole group of people hiding behind these trees, trying to shoot them down. He said, this continued from the time of Ghalas all the way to noon time. Can you imagine how many hours? He's continuously just after them. He said, whenever it would be a plain flat area, I would hide behind the tree, shoot behind and hit their camels or their horses until they'd fall. And then I'd quickly run to the next tree. They would turn back. By that time, there was nobody there. So they always thought that there was a whole group of people behind them. It was that fast. It was going back and forth. And he said, whenever there was a hill and they had to go through a small pass, I would go on top of the hill really quick and throw stones from the top. Finally, they ran. They ran for their lives thinking that, you know, there's a whole bunch of people behind us. And not only did they leave the camels behind, but whatever they had brought with them, even that they left behind. All their weapons. And they had 30 burda, very precious, very um, expensive type of shawls. They took it all off. Two, it decreased their weight so they could make faster getaway. So they could go faster. And he said, as they threw away their things, I would take a stone and put it on top of each one to make sure it doesn't fly away. Finally, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, they got some help, reinforcements from the tribe of Banu Ghatfan. The person's name was Ayyin ibn Badr al-Fizari from the tribe of Banu Fazara, which is a clan within, uh, within the tribe of Banu Ghatfan. He came and I was on top of a hill and he looked, he said, you fools, don't you know? Don't you see that this was not a group of people? This was not a group of people that was following you. It was just one person. And whenever you used to shoot arrows, you keep on saying, take this. I'm the son of Aqwa. Just like we read yesterday about Asim bin Thabit. When he was shooting his arrow, he would say, Ana ibn al take this. That was the way. Take this from me. I'm ibn al so he would, he would shoot an arrow and say, I'm Ibn al-Aqwa. So he's on top of this hill and the Uyayn ibn Badr is telling them, you fools, if you had even bothered to look back and start following and seeing, you would know that there's only one man. Go. Now get on top of the hill and let him have it. Kill him. So he says, that they came up, a group of them started coming up the hill. How old is he? 12 years old. He said, I said to them, listen, I tell you, in the name of Muhammad sallallahu whose face is enlightened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَا يَطْلُبُنِي رَجُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ فَيُدْرِكْنِي وَلَا أَطْلُبُهُ فَيَفُوتُنِي Remember, anybody who goes after me, he'll never get me. And if I go after him, he's dead. He was the fastest runner. So one of the men said, Inni adhunnu. I think he's right. Let's go back. They were really scared of him. So he went back. They didn't even bother. In the meantime, one group of people had arrived. One group of the Sahaba had arrived. Who? He had sent Rabah to go call them. One group had arrived. And Rasulullah was also coming. Akram and Abu Qatada. Remember we mentioned Abu Qatada? So they were two of these people that were at the front of the group that was coming to help Salama radiallahu ta'ala. And he said, whenever I would reach a hill, I would look on top to look, I would look towards Madinah Munawara to see, is anybody coming yet? How long am I going to go? Finally, Akram came and he came down the hill and he held his sword, uh, his, his reign. And he said, Akram, there's a lot of guys here. They're big fighters. They're good fighters. And... I think you should wait until Rasulullah comes and a group of good number of Sahaba come, then you can fight. And he said, He said, Salama, if you believe that the Rasul of Allah is Haq and you believe Allah is Haq, let go of my reign and don't come between me and martyrdom. He said, I let him go. And he went and he was killed. 30 of them, he was only one. 
Then Abu Qatada went and he also fought and he killed one of them and took over the, one of the, the horses of one of them. And that's a long story. But the point is, that part of, I don't want to mention that part of the story that's going to go off our main subject. By that time, Rasulullah had arrived with 500 Sahaba Ridwan Allah Mejman. Mentioned, 500 Sahaba arrived. Salam ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, they can come, I'm going to keep on going after them. By this time, it was night now, the time of Maghrib. How long has he been after them? Since morning, the time of the beginning of Fajr, Ghalas, he's been running after them. And they thought, he's left us. You know, we don't have anybody behind us now. So they were camping out in a place and they were just sitting around the fire and suddenly an arrow strikes one of them. And it says, take this, this is Ibn al-Aqwa. And one of them says, is this the same Aqwa from the morning? Aqwa'i bukratan? Is this Aqwa'i from the morning? Bukratan from the morning? Wallahi, this is a jinn. This is a jinn. They told Ayina, this is a jinn. How is he following us like this? So finally, Rasulullah came. Salam ibn Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala when he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, give me a hundred of your men. A twelve-year-old boy is telling, Ya Rasulullah, give me one hundred men, I'll straighten them all out. I can take them captive. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no, no. No, he says, he says to him, he says, Abu Salama, you think you'll really do that? Akunta fa'alin, Ya Salama, will you really do that? He said, of course I will, Ya Rasulullah. Give me a hundred men. He says, no, no, no. They've already probably reached the area where their tribe is located of Banu Ghatfan. Just leave them alone now. Rasulullah liked this so much, his bravery. And from morning until the time of Maghrib, he said, Wallahi akrabak. May Allah subhanahu I swear to Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you izzah. And Rasulullah smiled. Look at this boy. He has so much courage, so much bravery. He's saying, give me under men, I'll go after him now. He never tires. So Rasulullah wasallam on that day, he gave him the share of the Faris. The rule was, when they went on an expedition, there would be two types of people. One was a person who's riding the horse, and one would be the person who's a cavalry. The cavalry can't do as much as the horse rider can, can, defeat, can cause much more harm to the enemy. So they would get two shares, while the person on foot would only get one share. But Rasulullah gave Abu uh, Salama ta'ala anhu the share of a horse rider, in other words, two shares instead of one. And he said, the best of our horse riders is Abu Qatada. Because he was also participating in this. He came a little later. And the best of our Rajal, the, the cavalry, is Salama. Nobody's better than Salama in cavalry. Because he was so fast. Then Rasulullah honored him when they were going back on their way to Medina Munawwara. He let him sit on his mountain behind them. They were on their way back to Medina Munawwara. There is a man from the Ansar. Very, very fast. Nobody could ever def- could outrun him. He kept on making an announcement in the group of Sahaba and Rasulullah sallallahu Hal min musabiq? Anybody want to race me? Anyone want to race me? Every little while he'd say, Anyone want to race me? Come on. Salam ibn Naqwa was ignoring him. He was sitting behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't want to leave the spot. He wants to stay behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he was really getting pushed. His buttons were getting pushed too much. He said, "Ama tukrimu kareeman wa la tahabu sharifan. You have no respect for a respectful person. And you have no awe for a noble man. Why do you keep on saying this over and over again? You have, in other words, he's saying, have some respect for me. You know who you're talking to. He says, he's the man says, no, I have no respect for anybody except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, okay. He says, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission. I'm going to alight from the mount and I'm going to, I'm going to race him. 
Rasulullah said, are you sure? He said, yes, yes. He said, yeah, Rasulullah, just watch. He comes off the mount and he says to the man, he says, go. You go. So, he waited until that man was about sharafan or sharafain. At least two hills ahead of him. Two hills ahead of him. And then he said to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi he said, Ya Rasulullah, watch now. Then he started running. He ran and ran and ran until he caught up with him. And then he slapped him in the back between his shoulder blades. He said, got you. I hit him between his two shoulders with my hand and I said, I got you. Sabaktuka wallahi. I beat you, I outrun you, wallah. So he laughed. The man laughed. He said, Inni adunno. Yeah, I know. Fastest runner in Arabia. This is Salama ibn Akwa and this is at the age of 12 years old. This was what he was known for. Imagine his bravery. And this was really, this was the case of all the Sahaba. Imagine if this was the, the, the level of a person who's only 12 years old. Imagine the Sahaba who are much older. Their level of bravery. You, know, you could die the next minute. You're facing 30 men. On horses. Fully, fully equipped. With weapons. And you're on foot, and you have your bow and arrow, and you have your javelin, but what chances do you have against these people? But they were so committed to the deen, subhanAllah. So bold, so confident, no? I'll take care of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like the Sahaba Radwan Allah. May He put these beautiful qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Sahaba, may He give us those beautiful qualities as well. This is a special dua we should make now. This time, between Asr and Maghrib, on the day of Juma, month of Ramadan, and this is the last Juma, my brothers, of this Ramadan. Whether next Juma, another next Ramadan comes upon us or not, we don't know. Time of acceptance of dua. Last Ramadan of this Jummah, please make dua. Lot of dua. Our brother Pasha just heard about him. His father just had a heart attack a little while ago today. He's in the hospital right now. He's gone to visit him. Make special dua for him. And make a special dua for me. Of course, it's very important. Make special dua for the Ummat of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Make special dua for yourself, for your needs. Your needs of the akhirah, your needs of the dunya. The needs of the akhirah are more important than the needs of the dunya. Ask for Jannah. Ask for Iman. Ask for strength of Iman. Ask for the pleasure of Allah. Oh Allah, give me the tawfiq to attain your pleasure. Give me the tawfiq to live my life in such a way that I achieve your pleasure. Give me death in the state of Iman that I'm saying the kalima La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Make these du'as. You don't know how to make du'a? Ask Allah. Allah, I don't know how to make du'a. Just put whatever is right in my heart. Is it time for du'as? Please make du'a inshaAllah. Subhanallah bihamdi. Subhanakallah bihamdi. Kashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu